I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator, Jay Gilliam, USAID Senior LGBTQI Plus Coordinator to get us started. Over to you, Jay. Thank you, Julie, and hello and welcome to everyone, wherever you're joining us from around the world. And welcome to Making the Workplace Work for All, a conversation for LGBTQ plus activists on strategies to advance worker protections and inclusive growth. As Julie said, my name is Jay Gilliam. I use pronouns he, him, his, and I am the senior LGBTQ plus coordinator at USAID. And we're so happy that you are here with us today. Today's event was organized in collaboration with the USAID Center for Economics and Market Development and the Market Links platform. Prior to kicking off the main program, I am excited to introduce USAID's Chief Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Officer, Nene Diallo, to offer some opening remarks. Chief Diversity Officer Diallo is USAID's first ever Chief Diversity Officer. A link to her bio is in the chat box. You know, since she has started this position, Nene has been a strong ally and advocate of efforts on LGBTQI plus inclusion. So please join me in welcoming her today. Nene, over to you. Thank you so much, Jay. And greetings and welcome everyone today. My name is Nene Diallo. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm so happy to be here with you all today to serve as the agency's first chief DEIA officer here at USAID. As I pondered on the theme of this session, making the workplace work for all, I immediately reflected on my own experiences as a cisgender black woman throughout my career. I know firsthand what it feels like to be the only in the workplace. I know firsthand what it means to be marginalized, subjected to microaggressions, or made to feel unworthy of my title or position. I wish I could say that my experience was over 10 years ago or even five years ago, but it's been as recent as when I was appointed to this position. It's sad to say, but the workplace is not fully working for all people. And without acknowledging that, I certainly cannot expect to influence meaningful change in my role. The timing of this event could not have been better to showcase some of the work that we're doing here and around the world at USAID within the DEIA space and particularly on the topic of LGBTQI plus protections, inclusion, equity, and accessibility in the workplace and beyond. From our newly updated DEIA strategic plan to our soon to be released updated LGBTQI plus 101 training that will be mandatory at USAID, and to our implementation of Executive Order 13988, preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. We are making real measurable progress towards advancing equity and making USAID a more safe and inclusive environment for our LGBTQ plus employees, allies, and partners. The USAID DEIA strategic plan includes specific goals related to advancing equity for USAID's LGBTQ plus workforce. These include striving to ensure that the federal health benefit system equitably serves all members of the workforce and their families, as well as expanding the use of gender markers and pronouns that respect the transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary workforce. Through USAID's Executive Order 13988 Working Group, led by then Office of Civil Rights and Diversity, we updated more than 100 chapters of USAID's internal operating policies to ensure they are using inclusive terminology regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. We've instituted a practice to ensure civil rights considerations factor into every agency operational policy change. All new policies must now include an assessment on whether the new policy might exclude or disadvantage a group of people and how any negative impacts can be mitigated. That being said, there's significant progress, progress to be made within our federal government and our country at large in this space. After all, the DEI office exists to unravel structural inequities that have persisted for centuries. Despite all of the work we're doing at USAID to ensure equitable access to rights and opportunities, regardless of gender or sexual identity, some of our workforce and partners still face barriers to equal opportunity and full inclusion in our workforce and in our programming. With all the work that we're doing, we know that the best way to address the needs of USAID staff is to hear straight from them. USAID is a learning organization, and we are committed to ensuring that our DEIA efforts are evidence-based and data-driven. 
We're currently developing USAID's first ever DEIA climate survey. This survey will expand USAID's insights into the makeup of its workforce through the collection of expanded demographic data across the entire workforce and will help us better unpack staff perceptions related to the agency's DEIA efforts. DEIA councils formed by USAID staff are working towards implementing and accelerating broader agency DEIA goals and objectives while also focusing on attending to the unique DEIA challenges within their missions. We are especially proud of USAID's new DEIA toolkit because it puts power and resources into the hands of our staff as they work to lead innovative DEIA efforts. And I'm also proud to see that the agency leadership is committed to hiring DEIA advisors in bureaus and even in missions. So while we work to advance inclusion and diversity within our workforce, it's important to acknowledge that this is not the experience of millions of people who come from minority groups or from the LGBTQI plus community across the world. So as an international development organization, it's important that we ensure our programs are void of discrimination and prejudice and that the rights of all women and mankind are taken into account. I was especially pleased when I started to know that UCID created a senior LGBTQI plus coordinator position to ensure that LGBTQI plus people are meaningfully integrated into USAID's inclusive development programs, policies, research and training. Another example of the agency's commitment to DEIA. So, it's my distinct pleasure to turn the spotlight back to USAID's current L senior LGBTQ plus coordinator and the moderator for this event, Jay Gillian. Thank you again for having me and I look forward to the discussion. Over to you, Jay. Great, thank you so much, Nene, for those really heartfelt words um, and really appreciate what you're doing to help frame today's discussion, including what we are doing at USA to really walk the walk in this space. Um, and I know our team also shares your excitement about the upcoming launch of our LGBTQI plus 101 uh, training, LGBTQI plus inclusion in USAID's workplace, uh, which has been under development uh, for more than a year. So we're really excited when that launches soon. Again, everyone, welcome once more to today's event. I'm really pleased to be joined by an outstanding panel of experts in LGBTQI plus inclusive development trailblazers from all around the world. For today's discussion, I wanna frame USAID's focus on LGBTQI plus workplace protections before starting the panel discussion. After the panel, we will move to a Q&A portion with the audience, you all, and then I'll wrap up the event today with some brief reflections on our discussions. So please join the conversation by putting your questions for the panelists, myself, or Chief Diversity Officer Diallo in the chat box, and we will do our best to respond. And of course, please remember to be respectful to one another and to our speakers. We also encourage you to amplify the conversation on Twitter and tag us using at USAID underscore LGBTQI. Again, that's on Twitter at USAID underscore LGBTQI. So before we move to the panelist discussion, let me share some additional context about what inspired today's conversation. For USAID, LGBTQI plus persons access to safe, inclusive, and non-discriminatory non workplaces is part and parcel of inclusive development. For us, inclusive development is an understanding that every individual and community of all diverse identities and experiences are instrumental in the transformation of their own societies. Their engagement throughout the development process just leads to better outcomes. We know that LGBTQI plus persons bring labor, dynamacy, and entrepreneurialism to workplaces and marketplaces in every region of the globe. That's why it's unacceptable that only 32% of countries globally guarantee some protections from discrimination at work based on sexual orientation. And only 10% offer some level of protection at work based on gender identity. Clearly, discrimination, intimidation, harassment, stigmatization, and exclusion impacts the inclusion, livelihoods, and dignity 
of LGBTQI plus persons all around the world. This will be discussed in much more detail by our panelists today. In a blog kicking off the USAID Market Links LGBTQI plus theme month, I, quote, I quoted Yako Seliers from the United Nations Development Program, who said in 2018, quote, access to decent work forms an essential part of LGBTI persons' lives and is deeply intertwined with their socioeconomic empowerment and ability to participate in the public sphere. Discrimination towards LGBTI people in the workplace also represents a fundamental challenge to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development's commitment to leave no one behind, end quote. You know, growing up in Texas and in my early professional career, I myself had anxiety about coming out and being my authentic self at work. In my first job, I wasn't out. I was afraid to be my true authentic self to clients, to colleagues, to customers. And that hindered how I could do my work, how I could do the work the best way that I knew how. My next job, I was able to start coming out. But as every LGBTQI plus person knows, coming out is a process. Coming out is a continual thing we do. And although it gets easier, it's never quite easy when you're doing it in a new space, particularly in a new workplace where your livelihood is on the line. So we know that other than being a fundamental component of human dignity, the data supports that being our authentic selves in the workplace, in our lives, is the smart thing and the right thing to do for societies and whole economies. You know, for example, a 2022 Open for Business study from Keller et al. found a positive correlation across the world between economic resilience and LGBTQI plus inclusion, including employment discrimination protections. Another study from Prehen et al. of 12 English speaking countries in the Caribbean found that potentially hundreds of millions of dollars were lost in regional GDP due to labor market discrimination impacting LGBTQI plus people. This clearly packs a punch for individuals, communities, societies, and whole countries. And it's also clear that major stressor, stressors like the COVID-19 pandemic have acted to exacerbate these challenges for LGBTQI plus individuals, given the community is disproportionately represented in, or rather pushed into the informal sector. A senior LGBTQI plus coordinator, I worked with my team in the inclusive development hub here at USAID and across our agency to build new training modules on LGBTQI plus inclusion in the workplace, as well as conduct virtual trainings on LGBTQI plus inclusion to staff at headquarters and admissions around the world. Similarly, as I mentioned at the inaugural Summit for Democracy last December, USAID intends to support a new public-private partnership that will, among several things, seek to bolster the economic livelihoods of LGBTQI plus people during and after the COVID pandemic. I also want to share an exciting recent programmatic example from India involving transgender individuals in water, sanitation, and hygiene, or WASH as we call it. In 2021, USA partnered with India's WASH Institute and, and the academy to provide skills training for community self-help groups to address local issues in more than 1,000 cities and towns, including training on how to operate and manage fecal sludge treatment plants. Importantly, the program targeted youth, women, and transgender individuals. Because many transgender individuals lost their earnings from working at bus stands and railway stations as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, USA trained more than 30 members in August 2021. This included developing their leadership skills and technical skills in fecal sludge treatment, disposal of treated wastewater, reuse of sludge for agriculture, and monitoring the quantity and quality of effluent. 
The training helped participants get jobs and earn a monthly salary. Quote from one participant, we use this as an opportunity to educate ourselves and move on to better things. Additionally, because the training program imparts knowledge about government benefits, some members of the group were able to get government issued cards, allowing them to access free and subsidized food for low income citizens. Importantly, this initiative provides a model for expansion and is inspiring other towns to adopt similar messages. So let me be clear, this is a challenge that we have the tools, the technical expertise, and most importantly, the urgency to address. This brings me to our panel today. You know, our objectives here are threefold. First, to clarify the link between LGBT Pride Plus worker protections, non-discrimination in the workplace, and inclusive development. Second, to grow awareness about key gaps and recent progress in safe and inclusive workplaces for LGBT plus people around the world. And finally, to spotlight global best practices, studies, and recommendations from LGBT plus civil society and technical experts to advance inclusive workplaces and protections. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists today. They include Ivan Mathoni, Kenya Country Director with Open for Business, Ramal Andav, Sogies Rights Officer with APCOM, and Nikoi Wilson, Policy and Advocacy Manager with Equality Jamaica, also known as JFLAG. We will share a link to their bios in the chat box. So as a reminder, please add your questions to the panel in the Q&A box so we can keep this event interactive. I also encourage the panelists to ask follow-up questions to the other speakers or offer your reflection on your experience. So to start our discussion, I wanna ask each panelist to describe the realities facing LGBT plus workers in your country and why you view inclusive workplace policies and practices as essential for inclusive economic growth. In this question, please address the legal and policy environment for LGBT plus people broadly, as well as specifically for workplace anti-discrimination protections. So with that, let's start with Yvonne. Uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here. My name is Yvonne Modoni. Uh, as Jay um, said, that uh, I'm the country director for Open for Business here in Kenya. Uh, my intersectionality lies between the private sector where I used to work before and um, the CSO and NGO space where I'm working now. Um, and because of my background, of course, I have a bias towards uh, workplace inclusion um, and ensuring that the private sector is taking more action um, towards LGBTQ inclusion, especially in countries like Kenya where the laws are still uh, I mean, we still hold on to colonial laws that have not been repealed and is is, is the work that we're undertaking um, in, in this country and in many countries in Africa, I think about 52, 50, yeah, about. Um, so I currently work with Open for Business. Uh, I'm a consultant for Open for Business. Um, and Open for Business is a UK-based charity working with the private sector for the advancement of LGBTQ inclusion. Uh, we are a coalition of over 35 uh, global companies, many of which operate in Kenya, but all of which have a footprint in Africa. Um, our goal is to make the economic and business case for LGBTQ, LGBTQ inclusion through evidence-based research, um, and as such, make the case that businesses should become stronger allies for LGBTQ inclusion. We also work to create a more inclusive culture um, in cities and societies in general, thus creating stronger allies, of course, for LGBT, uh, for advancing LGBTQ rights, and, consequ and consequently hope to see um, a repeal of the penal codes in Kenya, that's 162 and 165, um, a court case that is being led by CSOs in Kenya, which include um, the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission and the Gay and Lesbian um, Coalition of Kenya, which is an umbrella organization of many different organizations like ISHTA, Minority Women in Action, and other 
CSOs in Kenya. Um, we, we, we hope to achieve uh, this change through, of course, one is our research. Um, we have a number of, of publications that we have um, that we have on our website. Um, one, of course, of key importance to me is the Kenya report, the, the economic case for LGBTQ inclusion in Kenya. We have the Channels of Influence report, which is a great tool for businesses that want to know how to um, act uh, and what to do in the public sphere. We have the Cities report, uh, which is a great tool also for um, for for cities, for mayors um, who want to improve uh, inclusion in their cities, and many other um, many other uh, publications. Um, we also host bilateral and collective. Uh, quarterly roundtable meetings with business leaders. And this is just to increase the engagement of the private sector with open for business work. Um, we also ensure that we are participating in key business um, discussions and events such as these uh, and other conference and summits because um, of course we want um, our reports to be heard and to be publicized as much as possible so that CSOs, leaders, policymakers are able to use um, the information that we have there, our findings. Um, then we also partner with key development actors, CSO leaders and government bodies to advance inclusion and amplify each other's work. We are all working in the same space. Our goal is, our main goal is the same, is to ensure that everyone feels safe, secure, and can be the, the, the authentic selves. And so we work with different partners um, to try and bring this collective goal of LGBTQ inclusion in societies uh, a reality. Um, and for me, it's, it's of course, especially in this challenging uh, market such as Africa. Um, the Kenya laws are not that uh, supportive. Um, of course, there's a, re there's a penal codes 162, um, and 165 that are being challenged in court. Uh, workplace protections are very general and vague, uh, but there have been some improvements. There have been some advances in in in, in certain aspects. Um, yes, thank you. Great, thank you, Ivan. And it sounds like uh, you and Open for Business have a lot of resources uh, that you're offering folks in terms of how to advance. Uh, non-discrimination and LGBTQI plus inclusion. So I'm, I'm sure that's really been helpful for, for the folks that you all are engaging with. Um, I wanted to turn it over to Nikoi to share about the work you all are doing at JFLAG. All right, um, again, I'm Nikoi Wilson, Policy and Advocacy Manager for Equality Forum Foundation, also known as JFLAG. Um, the situation in Jamaica um, is, uh, In terms of the discrimination that people face, um, about one third of LGBT Jamaicans um, indicated um, in our needs assessment that we did in 2019 that they experienced some challenge because of their, um, you know, their their LGBT um, status. Um, and so, um, I think when it relates to just the, the the issues that LGBT people face in the workplace in Jamaica, you know. Um, even they may enter the workplace and the hiring practice may be non-discriminatory, but then when they interact with colleagues and supervisors and sometimes managers, you know, they face um, discrimination. Now, this discrimination is 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 rooted just 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 um just like Ivan, uh, like in, in Kenya where you know there's a retention of these colonial laws. Um, in Jamaica, we have retained the Offenses Against the Persons Act. I believe it's an 1865-64 Act. It's a very old act, and uh, um, it basically helps to perpetuate the, 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 the stigma and discrimination against LGBT people. And interestingly, one of the things about Jamaican society is that we had done a, a perception study um, some time ago, and it, the, the, the Jamaicans indicated basically that, okay, LGBT people should be treated fairly. So over 80% of them would have indicated this, that, hey, you know, LGBT people should um, be treated fairly. But when it came on to um, the repeal of the Bogri law, 
um, you know, most of them would have said, you know, it should be retained. And even more recently, um, one of our local newspapers did a poll um, and a significant number of people believe that the law um, should be retained. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that we want to see um, happen, um, you know, the repeal of those laws. Um, there are there there is a church um, that is very strong in Jamaica, and they would they advocate for the retention of the law because for many Jamaicans it's almost uh, it's almost as if it's a uh, it, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, almost like a cultural status symbol. It's something that reaffirms that okay we are a Christian society because Jamaicans like to say we're a Christian society, and so you know repealing this law it, to them is you know is opening the floodgates. Um, although. Um, the reality is the police isn't hunting down LGBT people in Jamaica. Um, you know, the prosecution of, of, of consenting adult males um, is not so is, isn't, isn't something that is you know, really heard of. Um, in fact, when we did an analysis of 10 years of data um, looking at the buggery law, over 80 percent of the cases actually involved, you know, children being buggered. Um, and the reality in Jamaica, when it comes down to that, is that buggery is not considered rape. And because there's a prescribed um, sentence in the law of maximum 10 years, um, and then for rape, the starting point for rape is 15 years, you know, there is that disparity um, and inequality between, you know, when you compare those two, um, two, two things and how it's compared. So, yes, um, you know, that's the situation in Jamaica. Um, and I mean, it, it, is, it is improving. Um, and I think, I mean, as we will speak about um, later on, the business process outsourcing um, sector, you know, which has like call centers, etc., they have kind of taken the lead in Jamaica on, you know, creating those sort of inclusive and diverse um, workspaces. Thank you for that, Nikoi. And I think you you really laid out the connections between, you know, society's perceptions of LGBTQI plus persons. Um, how those impact uh, the, the freedoms uh, for getting jobs, for experiencing harassment and discrimination in the workplace, um, but also a little bit of, of hope from some of the research and, and polling that's being done that, that things might be improving in Jamaica. So thanks for that. Ramil, I want to come over to you and, and share the work that you all are doing at APCOM and um, kind of what, are, what is the environment that you all see uh, this happening in, in terms of uh, addressing workplace uh, protections and inclusion. Hi, good evening from Bangkok, Thailand. I'm Ramil Andag, so GSC Rights Officer of APCOM. APCOM is a regional non-government organization, and we work in Asia and the Pacific region, and we have country partner organizations in most of the countries in, in, in the region. And we work on health and rights, of people and communities of diverse OGSC. So for the rights part, that would be basically the what we're doing on LGBTQ OGSC and LGBT specifically on LGBTQI social and economic inclusion. So we're doing a lot of work on engaging private sector and multilateral development banks for for SOGSC inclusion. And same as Jay said earlier. Um, in, in the region, there are still laws. There are some countries where, law, where there are laws which criminalize consensual sexual sex acts between same-sex same sex acts. And, but even if in a country, for example, where it is not criminalized, there are no laws. That, 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 that mostly there are no laws which recognize or protect against discrimination based on SOGSC. And, and, and we, we, we there, but there are also some countries which has protection, broad protections in their constitution and recognition. Some positive developments, there have been decriminalization in, in, in some and moves to decriminalize consensual same-sex acts and discussions around same-sex marriage and or unions, but generally there's still that lack of, of protective laws and laws which recognize. And, and I think also that for, for private sector, even if, for example, the, the private, private sector still works within the ambit of the legal and 
legal and policy environment of a country. <clears throat> and I think we should not, for me, we should not divorce the legal and policy environment with the actual experiences of LGBTQ individual and communities. Research, including the research which APCOM did, which indicate there's still discrimination based on SOCHI SC, not only in the workplace, but in, in, in other rights, basically, and other outcome, development outcomes, if we, if we are going to say that, access to education, access to healthcare, and specifically in the workplace, um, research would show that discrimination happens in finding work, interviews, applying for work, um, keeping jobs and promotions. And there are experiences also of microaggression. And I think somebody, all, microaggression was said earlier. And these are based on prime, the prevalent binary conceptions of how the world should be. Um, policy change takes a lot of time. And LGBTQI civil society organizations have been very active in this policy change, in this campaigns for policy changes. Um, but I guess also, even perhaps we can also look at those neutral laws, because some of these supposedly neutral laws are also being used disproportionately versus LGBTQI. Um, maybe a challenge also, even if. We're talking about workplace. How do we also look at at, at other help, at other development outcomes and rights from a more in, intersectional and interrelated kind of perspective? If if an LGBTQI person would have limited access to education, for example, this would have effects in the future, in the workplace or access to health. And also when we're talking of workplace, I guess it's it's more the formal work workplace, right? And COVID would show us that that COVID experience and data would show us that a lot of there are many LGBTQI people who are engaged in the informal kind of work. And how do we also talk about protections on this? I hope that makes sense. No, no, definitely, Ramon. I think, you know, your perspective and experience in Asia, I think, also um, connects that, you know, within every region, there are still a lot of ways to go in terms of, one, just talking about LGBTQ plus issues uh, in society and making advancements for inclusion in the workplace. Now, I want to go to some, um, some specific questions for each of you, uh, maybe going back to Nikoi. And Nikoi, can you just share a little bit around um, the work that JFLAC has done with case studies and, and rapid assessments for workplaces in Jamaica. Um, what have you found um, with regard to the challenges and bright spots for LGBTQ plus workers in Jamaica and for different types of workplaces? Okay, so we did a case study on the business process outsourcing sector. Um, for those of you who do not know what the that the business process outsourcing sector is BPO, um, it's it's basically um, focused on. I don't say it's focused on call centers, but it's it's that that's the bulk of what they do in Jamaica. Um, so they 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 come here and they set up call centers and they employ um, individuals. Um, I mean, there are issues in terms of the, the the amount of pay that these individuals get, which is you know also connected to the right to work. Um, but they have been for some time viewed as, um, I guess, the standard bearers for diversity and inclusion in Jamaica, because the 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 companies that come here they they tend to have um, inclusive policies from their you know head organization, and so those policies are basically adopted um, here in Jamaica. Um, however. Um, you know, while while the BPO sector does provide um, upper, you know employment opportunities for um, LGBT people, um, you know there there are still issues. You know when it comes on to you know promotion and you know whether or not you know the practices are in fact fair to LGBT people. Um, and you know there there's a feeling that you know I, I guess a sort of um, 
I don't, it's not, it's not necessarily not nepotism, but I guess favoritism within the workplace. Um, you know, would prevent you, um, you know, prevent you or, you know, allow you um, to, to get a promotion. Um, one of the issues that we, we, we found in the case study um, was that while the BPO sector does have inclusive policies um, in terms of, you know, applying it to our local situation, that's not necessarily something, you know, um, you know that is done. So the policies aren't necessarily, you know, put together you know, taking into consideration the, the cultural um, realities. Um, and when I, you know, when moving on to the, the, the rapid assessment that we would have done, um, one of the issues that we found there, and the rapid assessment was done among BPO sec the BPO sector, but also other businesses. Um, we found that, you know, businesses will have um, inclusive policies, but then it does not um, specify LGBT. Um, you know, and I mean, people will say, oh, why does it need to specify LGBT? And, you know, it's a reality in Jamaica that, you know, being LGBT is just is one of those things that, you know, you're likely to be discriminated. Um, you know, that, you know, that's a one of the bases on which you, you're likely to be discriminated. And so we have to, you know, kind of address it head on. Um, so, yeah, when it comes to the rapid assessment in terms of um, the policies, um, you know, there may be policies, you know, there, there, are, there may be the in inclusive policies, but then um, the employers, you know, don't necessarily know about it. Um, and this kind of reflects a, a general, um, you know, problem that, you know, the, the LGBT community faces is just not being aware of their rights. So when we do have sensitization sessions, you know, we realize that there is that gap. Um, in terms of knowing their rights. So, you know, it's also important for, you know, the workplaces when they have these policies, you know, to um to 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 um educate their their employees that you know that this inform them that you know that this policy exists, you know, and this is you know how it works. Um but yeah the 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 rapid assessment and the case study um would have basically in you in, know in, in a way confirmed um, what we already believed in terms of, you know, how culture plays a, you know, significant um, role, um, you know, in, in kind of helping to move the needle. Um, because even in, in organizations where people, you know, feel free to express themselves, um, there is, you know, there is still, there is still a hesitancy, you know, there's still the fear that, okay, when you leave the workplace, you know, will you be harassed by, you know, your, the same colleagues and then whether or not, and whether or not, you know, you, will you be comfortable, you know, to even make a report to say, you know, what, um, you know, this person has been harassing me, you know, because they believe that, you know, I am, I'm LGBT or because I'm LGBT. Um, so, you know, the, these are little things, um, that LGBT people face. Um, you know, within the workplace, and that was highlighted, you know, by these um, two documents. Just to say um, that in our, you know, in our bid to improve the situation for LGBT people, we are currently, you know, doing a project where we are adopting. So we have done workplace sensitization sessions before, but this year we specifically did a pro doing, we're specifically doing a project where we adopt five organizations and we take them through you know, LGBT rights, you know, the issues facing LGBT people, how they can create an inclusive workspace, you know, for LGBT people. And also even, you know, how can they celebrate pride within their workplace or just, you know, have, you know, decals up or, you know, stickers up or, you know, that will say, you know, for example, this is a non-discriminatory environment. Um, so, you know, that that's what we, we, we have been doing, um, particularly this year, you know, in trying to improve you know, the situation for LGBT people. We also created a, a safe space, um, an employer safe space manual, which basically guides employers on how they can create a safe work, um, work environment for um, LGBT people. That's really, really great. And I think, you know, you really do highlight the connections of the environment that we're all working in, right? Uh, really is important. Um, the policy change is, is also important, but for policies to be fulfilled and implemented in the correct way to, to fulfill their promise uh, that the environment to the work that we have to do to make sure that our societies are more inclusive of LGBT plus folks um, is just as important. Rommel, I want to come back to you. Uh, I know that EPCOM uh, works across Southeast Asia and has really been engaging with the private sector and entities like the Asian Development Bank on piloting projects and, and talking about strategies to advance LGBT, 
LGBTQ plus inclusion, non-discrimination in the workplace, and, and trying to institutionalize some safe spaces. So I was wondering, can you share any unique insights uh, from these experiences, including how institutions are engaging with civil society like APCOM and other partners? Yeah, um, not to say also that APCOM and our country partners are the only organizations who are in this in the in the space uh, um, engaging private sector and the finance sector. But for APCOM's experience, this we started the work which we have been doing on, on engaging the private sector and the Asian Development Bank in 2018 with our APCOM and our country partner organizations in Cambodia, Indonesia, Lao PDR, Philippines. And our engagements included partnership building, evidence building where we, we did research because I will also later say that evidence building has been very important when we're, when we're engaging with private sector and financial institutions. Capacity strengthening, uh, strengthening and awareness raising on SOGI SC among others. Um, for APCOM and our country partner organizations, when we started doing this, it was new to us. Also, our, our experience, our, our kind of travel we, we we did have a lot of we did have a lot of, of learnings and reflections um because for the most part our experience would have been with governments would have been with civil society organizations would have been with other development agencies and and bringing our collective lessons up and our country partner organization organizations our collective lessons learned and how we continue the work we're doing on financial sector and the private sector. Um, some of the our reflection is that some of the strategies which we have been using with governments, other civil society organizations, and other the, the, the traditional partners may not work. So we need to kind of reflect on on our on our approaches. How do we make our our frameworks resonate? For example, what, what will resonate with financial institutions? What will resonate with the private sector? And um, I think this was from, prof I heard this per from Professor Lee Bajet. How do we complement, and I hope I'm quoting her correctly. <laughs> How do we complement our human rights case with a business case? That being so GS inclusive is not only the right thing to do, but it also um, makes a good business case. And how do we equip also organizations with an understanding of how the private sector works, right? We cannot engage, we cannot, how do we, how do we equip ourselves with that? And, and how do we also get help from, from others on that? If we want to engage the private sector, it, it requires familiarity with operate, how they operate. Um, are there existing policies where in the private sector and in the finance sector where we can anchor our kind of calls and advocacies on. For example, ADB has Strategy 2030, which talks about prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia Pacific. Evidence building. Um, how do we develop robust evidence for our advocacies? In our experience, it's always asked. So our advocacies would need to be evidence-based. And also, how can, for example, something which we can look for more forward looking, how do we partner perhaps with private sector and the finance sector on, on evidence work? How can they partner with civil society organizations working on LGBTQI on, on evidence building? Um, but our approaching the private sector and the ADB, there was openness to discuss OGSC. And I think there have been, and I, there have been moves already in that. Asian Development Bank to on, on SOGS inclusion, including the policy review, um, the safeguards review. An important thing which I would like to highlight is engagement should be guided by the local context. What's the existing LGBTQI context and situation in a certain country? That's why for APCOM partnership with in country LGBTQ organizations is very important um, because things that we do should be guided by what's the local context. 
what can be done and what cannot be done within that context, ensuring that we're doing no harm. Well, I think that's uh, that's really really important. And actually, I want to pick up on that with the uh, the next question to Yvonne, uh, just around uh, you know engaging with other partners and and parts of society on this. Um, Yvonne, I know that you all do a lot of work uh, on network building and, and using research and, and trainings to sensitize uh, different parts of uh, society in Kenya. Um, and so, and as well as using kind of impact consensus statements to mobilize commitments from the private sector for inclusive workplaces. So I was wondering, can you talk about that work in terms of that network building and, and how to utilize that to make movement forward, uh, positive movement forward on inclusive workplaces? Uh, yes, thank you, Gillian. Yes, we do um, conduct, of course, the, um, I'd mentioned earlier, the uh, evidence-based research. Um, and this is mainly to provide a different angle, a different argument, uh, apart from the human rights argument um, and the religious argument, is to provide a different uh, angle. Um, in Kenya right now, our current president-elect has been heard saying that LGBT IQ issues are not a human rights issue. So how then can we make uh, a bigger impact um, with, 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 with our arguments? How can we, um, how can we add on to uh, the work that is already ongoing? How can we complement uh, what CSOs are doing? So we then uh, provide the evidence-based research, the business, um, the business case uh, that was just mentioned. Um, and the reason why we do this is because we want to provide uh, businesses with the toolkits that they, the, sorry, we want to provide businesses with uh, the language that they can speak. Because when, when, you, when you speak to a business leader, it's hard for them to, so sometimes it's hard for them to articulate uh, the human rights issue, but it's easier for them to articulate the economic issue, the business issue. And so this is what we try to achieve um, with our with uh, with our reports. Um, so we host bilateral meetings and uh, collective quarterly roundtable meetings. Uh, sorry, um, collective yeah, collective quarterly uh, roundtable meetings with business leaders to be able to sort of cross learn from each other and just to build networks. And we hope that. Uh, you know, our theory of change is that these business leader, leaders will in turn speak to a third party who was not at the meeting and they'll be able to articulate what the issues are in our language that they understand. Um, and of course, in the long run, we hope that this will shift uh, the government's positioning on, 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 on LGBTQ inclusion um, or just create a strong ally who can um, counter um, the religious community because in some in in most of these countries the religious community has a very strong um, sort of a powerful hold on politicians a powerful hold on leaders so who else can counter that and for us that is the business sector um, and the development sector too so our ours is to to ensure that we provide. Um, the tools that, uh, or the language uh, that that business leaders can use to articulate uh, what the issues are, um, and hopefully in turn that that will shift the conversation from, uh, you know, culture which has been an argument that, you know, it's it's, it's like when you sit with your friends uh, somewhere at a bar or whatever, and you're discussing religion, it never ends. It never ends. So what can we can we provide some evidence based? Uh, research or business case for LGBTQ inclusion. And so the, how we do it, of course, is by the roundtable meetings, by engaging with development actors such as UN, um, USAID, uh, embassies, um, other INGOs, uh, CSOs, just sort of trying to collectively use um, and uses are very, I'm using it very loosely, uh, but but have our connections uh, work for our mutual benefit. Yeah, that's really great, and um, that's that's a great lead into our our last question that I want to ask you all before we turn it over to all of our participants. So I'm, I'm following in the chat box the 
there are some really great uh, questions being asked there, and, and we're going to be able to get to those. Um, but for this last question for each of our panelists, um, we're going to make it a little quick, speedy response. Um, but to each of you, you know, we're really fortunate today to have uh, joining us development practitioners, implementing partners of USAID, as well as USAID staff, um, all of whom work to advocate uh, governments for an, uh, creating enabling environments that allow economies to be sustainable and inclusive. And so to each of you, uh, how would you recommend uh, all of the folks that are joining us today um, to partner with LGBT Cry Plus led organizations like yours to advance these priorities? Uh, what do you recommend uh, to have a successful cooperation and partnership that ensure LGBT Cry Plus people can thrive in any workplace? And so uh, first we're gonna start with McCoy and then go to Ramil and then end with Yvonne. Uh, I mean, outside of like funding for programs, I think that there is technical support and insight that could be offered, um, you know, in partnering with us, um, because I know, especially within the, for example, the United States, where, you know, there is a, there, you know, there's, there's, there, there, there are certain states that are more progressive, etc. Um, and, you know, we could get insight just in terms of, you know, how they dealt with, you know, the, the cultural realities. Um, there and probably even right now in terms of lobbying, I don't, we don't necessarily have lobbyists in Jamaica and I think that's possibly where we need to get to. Um, so I think that's another way just probably providing the technical assistance or training um, in lobbying so that we can effectively advocate, you know, our policymakers. Because one of the issues that we face in Jamaica when it comes down to policy change, and I think this may be the case, you know, everywhere, is, 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 is the lack of political will. So, you know, you'll speak to parliamentarians and other policymakers and they'll say, yes, we agree that this is the case. We agree that the law is unequal. But, you know, we do not want to commit political suicide by doing or saying things. And, you know, parliamentarians have said things in favor of LGBT people. It, it has happened. They have attended our events. Um, but, you know, going to their constituency and saying to their constituency that, you know, their constituents that, oh, LGBT people should be treated the same is not necessarily something um, that they will do. Um, but, yeah, I really do think that, you know, that, that really that, that technical support um, especially around lobbying, you know, would be very, very helpful because I think that's where we're lacking. It's really kind of moving from talking to the parliamentarians, sensitizing them, them becoming more aware, um, you know, to a, to a stage of, you know, um, kind of having them take action. Um, and I guess I can, you know, plug this here. And, you know, that's why right now we, are, we actually have a project funded by the USAID where we're doing a, a little bit more aggressive engagement of um, political actors. Um, we're doing three trainings with them. Um, this also includes trade unionists because, you know, the trade unions in Jamaica, um, they're very strong. Um, so we are engaging um, these individuals. We are, you know, we're creating a, a, a LGBT and human rights caucus. Um, we are doing research around LGBT issues, um, all to support, you know, this sort of initiative in terms of push that push for the policy change and um, giving the parliamentarians the, you know, the data they need and the support they need, you know, to not only make the statements, but to also, you know, take action. Um, yeah. So I really think that that's it. That's really how we have to partner. It's really getting that technical support. Um, kind of getting that insight and knowing how we can possibly approach certain situations um, in a different way and coming up with different strategies. Because even like the workplace um, sensitizations that we're doing now, the reason we decided to adopt workplaces was actually because of uh, a project that Stonewall has where they have in, in the UK, where they have actually adopted workplaces. Um, you know, there's a little uh, controversy around it, you know, with certain companies, etc. Um, but I, we thought it was just a really good idea to adopt these workplaces and to kind of just guide them, you know, take them under our wing, um, wings. Um, oh, just to say that outside of the sensitization sessions, that we also help with the development um, or review of their um, um, of inclusive workplace policies um, for them. Um, so that's also a part, you know, of 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 the the adoption. Thank you, Nicole. I think you just gave folks a, a lot of ways that they could join in. Some of the work that you're doing and and, and giving them ideas on, on how they can start partnering with LGBT plus organizations and some work in, in places where they are. 
Um, I want to hand it over to Ramnell for um, some closing recommendations from you. Thank you, Jay. And I think maybe just some reminders for we all, we all know this already on a general, on the, the more general frameworks of nothing about us without us, which requires a lot of meaningful engagements with LGBTQI people and organizations because organizations know the context, organizations know the situations, LGBTQI organizations know the situation uh, and do no harm. How are we being informed by local context? Sustained and meaningful partnerships. Um, one of events, for example, can be good, are good, you know, but how do we also elevate partnerships to a more sustained and more strategic? How do we, how do we offer also spaces for cross learning? Um, development agencies learning from civil society organizations, civil society organizations learning from development agencies. Um, how do we support the ongoing advocacies and, and activities of LGBTQ organizations? This can be evidence building, this can be campaigns. And, and how do we also open markets? Like private sector, how do we help in, in partnering with private sectors, for example, if that's something which is, which is possible? And how do we look at this from an intersectional perspective? I mean, so GSC and being LGBTQI is one of the basis for differential treatment and discrimination, but there are also other layers of identities, like rural, urban, age, abilities and disabilities, educational background, top of my head. <laughs> Thank you for that, Ronald. And those are all, all key things that we should always be keeping in mind, and particularly uh, what you started with, uh, nothing about us without us. Um, Yvonne, what, what some, are some of the recommendations you would offer folks? I, I, love, I love nothing about us without us. Um, but yes, um, I think for the development actors or the development practitioners, and for me, this is um, your UN bodies, your employment bodies, eh, sorry, your 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 consulates. Um, I think it's it's more mutual participation and more conversations around LGBTQ inclusion, especially in the countries which you 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 you, you have a presence in. Um, so not just have that one conversation on Pride Day where you have a photo op and then. One year later, we are back on the same table asking what are the issues, uh, but there's been nothing between July 2022 and July, 20, is it June? June 2022 and June 2023. So I think there needs to be more action towards that end that because, for example, consulates, um, they occupy or they have access to very powerful spaces. So hopefully this uh, message, these conversations that we have are conversations that they can carry forward um, to these spaces that they have access to, uh, to these conversations that they have a privilege of being a part of. Um, and that, that also speaks to them being messengers of impact for LGBTQ inclusion. Um, just uh, more effective dialogue, policymakers, what also for you, do you feel are the gaps that CSOs have not filled for you to be able to articulate uh, the message of LGBTQ inclusion and what the issues are? Um, of course, it's also funding uh, things like research. There's a lack, desperate need for research, especially in Africa, and especially for it to be online. Uh, this quite, it's quite difficult. We were, we were conducting um, research with UNA, with the, not UNAID, uh, UNDP um, for certain cities and, you know, countries like Zimbabwe ha barely have any, any um, information online. And this creates such a difficult uh, situation uh, when you're trying to conduct research and 
research and fill some gaps. So just funding towards those uh, certain activities that form the basis of, of the strategies that a movement uh, will take. Uh, for employers, it will be mutually beneficial partnerships. Um, whether you're going to support civil society organizations and other NGOs financially, or whether you're going to support in kind, if you, if you own a hotel, give a discount or something of the sort uh, to CSOs who probably want to have a meeting, or if it's, um, let's say, you know, your, your, your uh, GlaxoSmithKline, um, is it possible to partner with organizations like Ishta or Nigelhack and have uh, free lube or things like that, like mutually beneficial partnerships? And even if it's about, um, you know, when you're giving aid to an another organization, apart from partnering with governments and, and, and big corporate uh, uh, companies, you can also partner with CSOs because that then it 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 it, uh, it sort of amplifies the work. It gives them an, an opportunity to amplify the work that they are doing. So those part those partnerships uh, for me are key. Um, then it's also you know just go through the channels of influence. Uh, it's a great resource. Uh, it's a great resource for for employers. It provides guidance for public action. Uh, by the private sector. Then we also have LGBT, LGBTQ inclusion uh, and the UN uh, and the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, which is just a guide, uh, sort of a, a, a premier, uh, a guide to linkages between SDGs and LGBTQ inclusion. And you know we are running out of time for us to fulfill our LGBTQ, our not LGBTQ, sorry, our UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so now is the right time to start linking those goals to LGBTQ inclusion. Then uh, for LGBTQ activists, ad advocates um, and CSOs and CBOs, we have a toolkit that we, we, we produced with the Workplace Pride. Um, I think it's a great resource for CSOs to use to be able to learn how to engage. It just gives a guide on how to engage with the private sector, because obviously it's not easy and the private sector needs constant engagement. The minute you, you, the minute you stop having these discussions with the private sector, they move on to what is the bottom line for the company and how are you making money? Uh, so you constantly have to keep um, reminding businesses that this is a business issue. Human rights is a, is a business issue. You're not employing robots. Well, not all of you. Um, then Another. we also, Sorry. Yeah, uh, maybe one more recommendation. Okay, one more for CSOs. We have a CSO training coming up um, in Kenya, um, and I think maybe this can be rolled out in other places where we, you know, where we, we're not there. Um, it's just same thing. Um, just training CSOs how to use our tool, our research as a toolkit. Um, but those are sort of like the general. Uh, recommendations that I would give. Thank yeah, you. And I would say those are some really great concrete recommendations that you, you've offered uh, everyone joining us today. Uh, we have some questions that have come in from the audience, and so I want to make sure that we have time to, to get through those. And just as a reminder, um, you can use the chat box to post your question, uh, and we'll, we'll direct it to the, the panelists or a particular panelist. Um, and direct, uh, questions can be addressed to the panelists, myself, um, or Chief Diversity Officer uh, Nene Diallo. But um, I know we got a, a first question early on, uh, just in terms of, is there a launch date for the USAID LGBTQI plus 101 training? Um, so what I can say is we are planning to launch it in early September. Um, the training is actually going to be really um, interactive. It's in a magazine type format and includes interviews with USAID staff uh, both in our headquarters in DC, as well as in uh, our missions around the world. And we're really excited about this uh, being launched and, and rolled out next month. Um, I don't know if uh, my colleagues who are from our Office of Civil Rights um, or from uh, Nene's Office in uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility uh, would like to add anything more about the training.
Okay, they might use the chat box to do that. Um, but stay tuned for for the LGBTQI plus 101 training. Uh, we also got a question from FHI 360 in Washington, D.C., uh, an implementing partner of USAID. Um, they write, I support workforce development programs globally. I'm wondering about the experiences of LGBTQI plus individuals in higher education in the panelist countries and the role that these institutions can play in supporting individuals as well as working with employers to advance inclusion. Uh, so this is a really great question from FHI 360 on, on how we do technical, educational, vocational training and higher education uh, in the panelist countries and in particularly the roles that these institutions can play in supporting individuals and, and working with employers to advance inclusion. Uh, would any of the panelists like to, to respond to this question? Sure. Uh, so in Jamaica, um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the cultural reality makes it difficult for um, any organization, um, you know, to, you know, make any real, take any real steps, um, you know, in trying to promote inclusion and diversity because they do not want to alienate their clientele, etc. Um, no, when it comes on to our higher education um, institutions, for example, the University of West Indies, um, they are, they're very, they're very, they're very inclusive. Their campus is inclusive. Um, I, I, I heard just last week that one of the halls of residence, you know, it was actually asked, you know, okay, if you identify, um, as you know, or as a, as a, you know, if you identify with the pronouns, he, him, or, you know, or she, or, or, or her, she, her, then, you know, you know, join here, join there. So, you know, no matter your sex, you know, you were able to still. You know, so that, you know, that's something that, you know, that is done. And I know that they do have a policy in terms of, you know, just general, um, how, you know, LGBT people are, you know, are treated, et cetera. Um, in terms of, you know, promote, get, you know, partnering with workplaces, um, I think that there is an opportunity there, but I think we do have to work, um, you know, internally in terms of just, you know, how the university, you know, operates. So, for example, um, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the medical sciences faculty um, to kind of inject, you know, LGBT um, issues within the curriculum so that these healthcare workers, when they, before they even get into the, the work environment, you know, they are aware of these issues and they are, you know, they are aware of how to treat, you know, with LGBT people. Um, so I think that's kind of a first step, you know, kind of being able to have that introduced into that curriculum um, and then, you know, kind of having that introduced in other curriculum. Um, and so even like, for example, um, you know, uh, what Ivan was saying about, um, you know, businesses kind of just, you know, being more focused on like, you know, the economics um, of it all. Um, you know, it's the same way in which, you know, you have to kind of inject that. So, for example, you're doing an economics degree. How does, how does LGBT issues, you know, um, you know, how, 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 how does that fit in there? You know, what, you know, even an, even an exam paper, even, you know, an, an assignment, you know, it could be a, a situation with an LGBT person. So it's kind of getting us to that stage where, you know, we're actually incorporating LGBT, um, issues into, you know, the, you know, every subject area, um, you know, it's, I think it's then when there's a recognition that this is actually very important, um, to promote and to push, um, that we'll be able to have like our educational institutions, you know, being able to partner with workplaces to, you know, encourage them to create more, um, inclusive work environments, especially because universities tend to do have these relationships with workplaces, especially as they have graduates, you know, leaving each year, you know, they feed them into these organizations. And so I think they are in a position um, to, you know, leverage, I mean, it's a large university, so there are a lot of students, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of competition, but you know, they can leverage that relationship to say, okay, we want to send our students there, but we want to ensure that the environment that we're sending them into you know, is one that's inclusive and diverse. Um, and I think they can especially do that when it comes down to like internships, um, you know, since they will have a little bit more control there. Um, thank, you, Nicole, thank you. I just want to make sure we can get through some of the, some of the other questions and, and see if Ivana or Ramil wanted to, to respond to this question before we move to the next. 
in our experience sparking conversation sparking accurate conversations and imparting information um sensitive information about so gsc having these conversations having this awareness raising is one awareness raising sessions is one good touch point because next steps could be discussed from there because largely there is that lack of awareness on 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 what's so gsc so uh, other points forward could be could be identified from there yeah, that's great it, it always opens a, a door to to having a, a broader deeper conversation on this ivan did you want to add anything before we, we move on to the next question N not really not really we've not really worked with the technical um and and, and yeah we mostly focus on private sector okay. well we have another question um from our uh, from the U.S. Department of Labor uh, to our panelists, uh, which is to what extent have you partnered with worker or labor organizations? And any any panelists can hop in here. We, I know you all talked a little bit about working with private sector, but what about uh, labor or worker organizations, unions, and whatnot? Um, so. As I had mentioned earlier, we are currently executing a USAID project, which focuses on engaging political actors and labor unions. Um, thus far, the engagement has not necessarily borne fruit. However, our discussions have been um, they have been very very encouraging. Um, you know, we we when we engaged the Jamaica Confederation of Trade Unions, which is one of the I, I I'd say groups. So this 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 confederation is of several trade unions. Um, they actually were very supportive, um, and they did say that this is something that they really should, in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination, is something that they should be focusing on, um, because it's something that you know their the international their international trade union organization um, that's a focus of theirs, and so they believe that they should be focusing um, on it. But it has been encouraging. The conversations have been encouraging, and I think that there is a relationship um, that can be built there um, that can that will eventually, um, you know, bear some fruit. Okay. Others, have you engaged with uh, labor and, and worker organizations? Um, we have we have engaged with uh, employment bodies, um, uh, private sector bodies, actually. Um, your HR uh, bodies. I mean, the engagement is still that engagement is still picking up slowly. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 sort of a new conversation to this uh, to these uh, bodies. Um, so still a lot of work to be done. But I would love to engage with ILO. That's great. It sounds like there's a there's a, a new opportunity. Um, ramping up for all of us to, to engage with uh, worker and labor organizations here. Yeah. We have another question um, from one of our friends, Eustace, uh, who says LGBTQI plus people are not a homogenous group. I think we all know that. So how can the specific needs of say intersex people uh, be addressed as they are often the most affected by workplace inequality um, of all groups within the rainbow? Um, so maybe panelists, can you talk about how you have addressed issues within our our rainbow community for particular groups, and if you've um, done anything around intersex issues, as as Eustace has asked? Um, for us, for example, in the research that we do, we make sure that our analysis is nuanced and that we look into the specific experiences. How is a certain, how is a certain experience differentially experienced by a trans woman, a trans man, an intersex person? Um, I would say that it's very important to to link up with groups working on intersex issues. They have the expertise in this. It's very important to link up with civil society organizations working on trans issues. Because they do have the expertise on this, but for and and upcom for us is we we 
we look into the specifics. How is something differentially experienced by a gay person, by a lesbian, by a trans woman, by a trans man, and an intersex person? Not to say that our data would be perfect, but we do kind of have that nuance. In. So thank you for that, Ramil. Uh, Ivan, Nikoi, do you have research or, or, or work that kind of helps uh, single out particular parts of our community and the work that you've been doing? No, because of the because of the nature of the work, I mean, it's an economic case for LGBTQ inclusion. Um, but I am happy that, uh, you know, in Kenya, the intersex um, um, organizations have done such a great job that they've been able to be included in census, uh, in, co in collecting census. And I think now they're working on how to fine tune and make sure that people are counted because I wasn't asked. Um, but um, they are working on that. We just provide that economic um, angle. So because of that nature, we don't work on specific um, groups. Um, for us at JFLAG, we don't have any data on um, intersex um, individuals. Um, in terms of how, um, how specific groups are affected in the workplace, um, I guess what I can say is that, you know, um, trans, trans persons are, you know, are more affected by workplace discrimination um, just because, you know, they, a lot of times they do want to express their gender in the way in, you know, how they feel and, um, and not every workplace is as open to that um, as, you know, as, um, as the, the BPO sector again, um, you know, has, has, has been accommodating um, um, to, 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 um, per, to the person of trans experience. Um, and have allowed them to, you know, be their true selves within the work environment. So again, you know, they are really kind of leading the charge and when mm -hmm. it comes to that. Um, but that's really the extent of our work when it comes to, um, um, you know, intersex people um, as the question would have asked. Sure, and I think, you know, this probably points, Yvonne, I think you, you noted earlier, just that there's a lack of data in general on LGBTQI plus persons and in, in this space, um, I know that we have a, a hard time just getting data uh, on in the development space on LGBTQI plus persons. And so it just makes it kind of that much more difficult and challenging to differentiate uh, different parts of the community and getting data there. But that is, this is definitely uh, a, a spot that we know we all need to be doing better and, and trying to find ways uh, to address challenges for particular folks who we know um, are within our umbrella are, are probably are more marginalized uh, because of, of their identity and, and who they are. Um, so thank you for that, Eustace. Uh, I, and that just is going to be challenging us to be doing better to collect some of that information. Um, we have one more question uh, I want to ask before we, we start wrapping up. And this is uh, from our participant in the UK. Uh, they say, I work with a government agency that partners on public health work in a number of countries with governments and institutions uh, that can be hostile, discriminatory uh, to LGBTQI plus persons in the community. And those conversations can be hard with those host governments uh, when advocating for these rights as a key priority. So the question is, uh, quote, I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts on how an external agency engages supportively non-extractively with NGOs and CSOs that have a difficult relationship with the in-country government. Um, and I think as we all opened up and you, you shared in terms of the work that you all are doing in, in different regions of the world, that uh, sometimes the, the government that you are advocating for is not the most open to LGBTQI plus issues. So um, how would you all respond to this participant in terms of how other um, government and, and development organizations and agencies uh, can have these really difficult conversations around LGBTQI plus inclusion uh, with host country governments. Um, I, 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 it's very difficult because um, I, I, I remember what everyone was saying earlier in terms of, you know, having these people in these powerful positions, being able to like speak to those who made the decisions within a country. Um, for us in Jamaica, we, 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 I guess we have a kind of hesitancy when it comes down to that, because when anytime there's external pressure, there's always the, 
notion that oh this is not us um this is you know this is the us this is the uk this is whichever other country forcing their agenda on us um and so it, it, it's kind of that we were kind of in that situation where okay um we would like we would like you know our our, our 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 local partners um you know the, the high commission the embassies etc and the, those who represent them the, the, the those bodies to speak to our policymakers and to say you know this is something that needs to happen um but i don't know how much of that we can do because the church is going to come out and say you know they're we're being they're being influenced by you know by, by by you know by um by foreigners so to speak um and you know so we're so that's kind of the challenge that we have um, and what we have been trying to do as well is kind of to localize you know the lgbt experience so we do have pride um so we do like recognize pride for june but we do we really celebrate it in august when we have our independence and and, and, and in the emancipation so you know we have tried to make it a little bit more culturally relevant and um you know I'll, we, we are trying to make it realize that being lgbt is not a foreign thing you know lgbt jamaicans have always existed etc um so that's kind of the the, the the balancing act that we you know we, we have to you know do because we don't want it to seem as if um you know the pressure is really just external because then that's going to cause more problems than anything else yeah for sure and i think that um, kind of goes back uh, i would sorry, sorry go ahead Ramil. i would go back to my point prior about meaningfully engaging with local lgbtqi organizations on more sustained and strategic engagements because local lgbtqi organizations know the context as i said earlier they are the, and let's look at locals at civil society, LGBTQI um, civil society organizations, not just as data sources. Mm -hmm. We are the experts on this. This is our lived experience and, and programs should be um, designed with us meaningfully participating in the crafting. Mm -hmm. Not only yeah. as implementers, not only as data source. These are mm -hmm. our lived experience. Yeah. Um, just yeah, just to add on that, um, I think yeah, again, it's about the nothing with us without nothing for us without us. Um, CSOs have worked really hard to try and and, and gain access into some of these uh, spaces um, with politicians and with governments and with everything. So working with them is really key. But there's also spaces like you know your parliamentarians for global action where you can have a conversation with someone like. It's it's not about approaching um, one very hardlined politician. It's looking for these spaces, parliamentarians for global action, uh, the European parliamentarians for action, or something like that. Um, some of these spaces where <laughs> where inclusion is really um, a priority, um, and have conversations with these leaders that are coming from all over the globe, um, and you will find not everyone is. Um, averse to LGBTQ inclusion. Yeah, not all the leaders are. Yeah, that, that's yeah. really great. I know that was a, a hard question, but we appreciate it. And thank you for these thoughtful responses to that, because I think a lot of folks who are joining us uh, want to be supporting all of the work that you all are doing. And so obviously going back to what Ramil said in, in terms of nothing about us without us and, and helping to make sure that whatever work that you are doing um, and having conversations with the local government um, that you want or are bringing in local civil society, as, as all of you have said, uh, to be part of that conversation. And that the work that you are doing is supporting the strategies, the, the work, the goals of those local movements. And I think that is the best way that you can use the privilege and power that we have um, with some of the, the governments that might not be open to these issues. So as we wrap up, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists um, who have uh, just shared some remarkable uh, experiences and expertise in this space with our audience. Uh, thank you to Chief uh, Diversity Officer uh, Nene Diallo and to USAID Center for Markets and Economic Development uh, and for all of you for joining today. You know, before leaving, I just want to uh, underscore three takeaways that I've had uh, from today's conversation, you know, one is the crucial role of engagement and that can look like a number of things, right? We just talked about, uh, it, using engagement with, with in country host government leaders. Uh, we also talked about trainings and workshops for employers. 
in, in terms of uh, partnering with civil society, uh, in terms of working uh, with technical es experts on LGBT pride plus inclusion. And so one, that engagement is really crucial to that work, whatever it looks like. Second is the need for multi-sectoral approaches um, that again, include the private sector, that include other employers. I think we have a, a, a chance and opportunity to, to look at the work that we could be doing with labor and worker organizations that came up today. Um, and even institutions like multilateral development banks that uh, APCOM is doing with the Asian Development Bank. Um, and then third, I think just the crucial role of network building, um, coalition strengthening, and the efforts of local partners like our panelists that are here today and the groups and activists um, that they bring to this work is crucially important in terms of the work that we are doing together to build LGBT cry plus inclusive work spaces. You know, for our part here at USAID, we're going to continue our efforts to walk the walk in this space, including building a, a work environment that is diverse, equitable, inclusive, and accessible, and with a door that's open for LGBT cry plus staff and allies. And so if you would like to get in contact with our LGBT Cry Plus team here at USAID and the Inclusive Development Hub, uh, you can always uh, email us at lgbtqi at usaid.gov, as well as follow us on Twitter at USAID underscore LGBTQI, and we will drop that in the chat box so you have it. But again, I want to thank our panelists and thank all of our participants today so much for joining in this really important conversation uh, on LGBTQI plus inclusion in the workplace. Um, this is just the start of the work that we all are going to continue doing together to ensure full inclusion in all the workplaces where LGBTQI plus uh, persons are. So again, thank you everyone for joining and we'll be in touch soon. Bye. Thank you.